Um, then in the phyla mascomycota, which includes most of the lichens, we have a couple different um, divisions on this first table, or uh, groups. And one that is a favorite are the cup fungi, and these include the morels, saddle fungi, um, and all the various cup fungi. So we have Pizziza, that's a pretty common brown cup fungus, and um, nowadays you pretty much need a microscope to totally know which one it is. You can put names on this from the books, but you may not be correct. One of the favorite little cups I like is Humeria hemispherica. This is a little cup that is pearly, pearly whitish gray inside and has brown hairs on the outside. It's a very, very cute little cup fungus, Humeria. Um, hemispherica means it's half round, so it's a half, um, half cup. Um, the, uh, most of you probably know blue stain of wood. And up here, we often find the little cups that um, grow with this. So there's a little cup, cup fungi on here that's associated with the Chlorosiboria. And then the other cup we have is Otidia onatica, which is the rabbit ear. And this is a big cup like Pizziza here, but more, more Chlorosiboria. But um, this cup is split down one side. I don't know if you can see that. There's a big cup, but uh, on one side, um, there's a, what you could call a sinus. It, the cup um, is split on one side down to the base. So that's Otidia, and Brooke has a song on that. Otidia, Otidia, the encyclopedia, Otidia, the pet mushroom. We have earth tongues and jelly babies, and I think we found one this morning. Um, if it shows up, we'll put it here. Then we have another group. Um, we'll have more of this stuff, the flask fungi. This is um, somewhat of an artificial group. There's a bunch of different families and things in this group, but um, the cup fungi make their spores on the inside lining of the cup and just shoot them up. So if you see a cup fungus and you sneak up on it, you can tap the ground or blow across the top and see a puff of spores. Or you can wrap this in a bag and then a couple hours later, unwrap it carefully and blow across the top, and you'll see the spores puff out if it's fresh. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. And there's some videos on... If anyone wants to see that, I got a video of it today. Oh, yeah, and if you have a good video, you can hear the hiss when all the spores shoot out. And it's a little a, too dry, probably. Yeah. Really good audio. Go on, <laughs> so, so it's a stimuli, so they're waiting for stimuli. So since we've been carrying it... Moving it and stuff, it's long since done most of it. Stuff. Yeah, but the, um, there's a person that we had for the Illinois Club that gave a talk on Zoom um, earlier this year, and she told us about how when they study these cups, the um, there's something, either air pressure change, usually air pressure change, or something that triggers the spores to start, and then there's a chain reaction across the inside of the cup for the spores shooting out from one spot and then it triggers the neck the neck the ones next door to shoot and these shooting spores create a column of air and the early ones go up a little ways but the later ones can go up a lot farther because it's making an air current that's up wow. so it's a way to shoot a bunch of spores and then a bunch of them will end up going farther because they get up higher in the air so these ascomycetes have um, a different sexual spore, se sexual cell that makes spores on the inside. These basidiomycetes down here, starting here, make the spores on the outside of a club. So the difference here is that most ascomycete types shoot their spores quite a long distance, um, and these flask fungi produce their spores on the inside of a little flask shape, little tiny flask. So if you look at your Hypomyces under a hand lens, you'll see little pimples. Each pimple, each pimple is the is the hole for the flask shaped thing underneath where the spores are shooting out. So if you put these on paper, you get a white spore print around around there. And then that's the Hypomyces lactiflorum, which is a parasite on uh, certain russula and certain lactarius, and it makes those a lot more edible. But you wanna you wanna talk about edibility on it? Oh yeah, this is one of the world's uh, great, widely served delicacy mushrooms. And it's really just a moldy mushroom. It's a moldy lactarius or it's a moldy russula. 
that's infected by the hypomyces and it changes the texture and the flavor from an acrid, which means unpleasantly spicy, like hot, but in a terrible way that you wouldn't ever want in your mouth, to this meaty, sweet, delicious, savory, umami flavored mushroom. And yeah, this is real dirty, but this is kind of how they usually look. This one is still, it's solid and heavy. Pick up the original mushroom, the, the lactarius or the russula, and it's kind of insubstantial, um, chalky, it breaks easily. This is a meaty piece of mushroom, and you would enjoy this well cooked and in your dish. So, um, a lot of people are interested in the cordyceps, and those have been split up into different groups. So we have this cordyceps, um, which was cordyceps capitatus. Um, it's got a head and a stem, and this head is, has little flasks where it's shooting spores out of little chambers. And then it has a stem to get it up above the ground, um, up through the moss. This is usually in um, deep moss. And down below here, if you dug this up, there would be little golden cords, and it would go down to a false truffle called Elaphomyces, which is mycorrhizal with a tree. So we have a mycorrhizal fungus false truffle underground, and we have this parasite on the Elaphomyces. And um, our research up in northern Minnesota with old growth forests, this um, this cordyceps, Elaphocordyceps, was very common, which indicated that the the host fungus underground was also one of the most common fungi in the uh, old growth um, conifer hardwood forest. Are they supposed to be medicinal? Is the, is the Some of the cordyceps, not this one. They don't know. Is the ones that are uh, that attack insects generally. Are the ones that yeah, especially the one in Tibet on the on the caterpillar. Yeah. So you'll find some of these other. Somebody found a, uh, probably something in this group on a beetle or something. This There's a beetle that came in. Yeah, yeah, yeah so that'll show up sometime. It's just a white mole that attacked the beetle. Um, then we move into these basidiomycetes that have different structures. Um, the first group are the chanterelles and trumpets. These uh, and vase-shaped fungi here. So we've got. Um, the um, chanterelle that's up here, the most common chanterelle up here is the Cantharellus enolensis, and that's a newly described one that's with conifers up here. And it's across the northern states and Canada, from northern Minnesota across to New England. And enolensis is named after Newfoundland Labrador, N-L. So they spelled it out E-N-E-L-ensis. So ensis means from or of, so it's of N-L. So, you might like the name or not like the name. That's um, a stretch. <laughs> That's a long walk yeah. for that name. Well, um, on the other side of chanterelle names, uh, one of the species in western Wisconsin that is around the state is yellow, but most chanterelles are yellow to orange. Um, and that one's named Cantharellus flavus, which means yellow. So, that's a very basic name. Um, the other chanterelle we have up here, which is not as common, is Cinnabrinus, and that's a Cinnabar chanterelle, and there's actually several species in here. I don't know if anybody's worked on the ones up north. There's different species in this group on the southeast and the Gulf Coast, and some of them are, are more red. But Cinnabar refers to the Cinnabar orange color. All the chanterelles are edible. And then related to chanterelles are the Craterellus, and those are edible. We've got the coveted Craterellus phallax, and you can see that this is our only specimen that made it to the table. It's a big one. But you can eat this because it's already dried up. Um, but that's our contribution for Craterellus. I'm sure there's some, a few more of them. If anybody has picked some, maybe put one on the table. We did have Craterellus color from it. Yeah, and we have duct tape. We can tape it down. <laughs> The other crater else we have is the yellow foot. Um, this has a bright orange stem and a kind of a yellowish tan cap. This is pretty common, especially in moss. Um, this, um, do you have any comments on eating these? Yeah, I do. Um, so the obviously the black trumpet is one of the delicacies of anywhere it's found, especially up in the North Woods. And we're hoping we see some more. Keep looking. They could, I, I did go scouting this last hour or so, and I did not find any. 
Um, so well, that our, just crushes our, my whole spirit, Artie! <laughs> our usual spots are not providing this year, but it is possible, so keep looking around yeah, the bingo. A few people found a few near the cabins here. Yep. So, oh. just look in the so when they're not fruiting where they usually are, that means they're often fruiting where they're usually not. So they, we may still find them, but look around the oak trees. That's where they grow. Arnie is a trumpet slaughterer. If anybody would know where they were and what they were doing, Arnie would know. Um, the bugs? Do they like the bugs? There is uh, one that I've seen in Spagnum with tamarack. Right, growing right up next to the tamarack, and I smell it before I see it, and I swear it's a different species, but it's so delicately textured that getting it home, it just ends up in a bunch of crumbs, and nobody ever looks yeah, at it. Yeah, there's uh, several species. The phalax is the most common one. Yeah. So, um, with the other chanterelles, uh, this is actually edible. Turbinellus is actually edible. It's tolerable. Like, I wouldn't write home about it, but you can eat this. Is that pig's ear? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I think it's, it's okay. Uh, it's one of them. It's one of the pig's the false, ears. One of the false chanterelles. Oh, yeah, the vase-shaped chanterelle. Um, this Cantharella cinnabarinus, the red chanterelle. These are fairly good-sized specimens. This one is delicious. If you heat the oil, throw these little mushrooms in there, cook them a little bit, then finish it with the eggs, it's got a peppery flavor, a sweet peppery flavor. I love this mushroom. Um, these yellow feet, is this all ignicolor? Yeah. So the, the, I call these yellow feet as well. Two by formis and ignicolor, I both refer to as yellow feet. This is the best mushroom I've ever put on a pizza. And I got that from a guy named Mike Wood who told me, put that on a pizza. And I did. This little mushroom is just, I can't even describe it. It's like where it belongs is on a pizza. Uh, yeah. Well, you want to cook it just to get it cooked in some oil and then spread them on the pizza and cook the pizza. So that, you always cook your mushrooms. That and its cousin, the the black trumpet, are also, that's, they're both one of my favorite things to put on any cheese dish, any any Italian-style dish. There's some other... They dry well, too. There's some other funnel stuff out there that are not colorful. This is a salephora or ground fan. It's sort of in the same group, um, but it's a brown vase-shaped mushroom, and this is also... All of these are mycorrhizal with tree roots. Uh, this is just in a different group, a Thalephora terrestris. Terrestris means it's on the ground, which is a weird name because most of these Thalephora are on the ground. Are those tasty? No. no. <laughs> uh, it's too tough. And I, I don't think, I don't know about the flavor. It might be yeah, bitter. I was going to say, about. we don't know, but no one's probably felt the need to eat that. I mean, there's places where they eat dirt, but I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, then we've got gilled mushrooms, and they go from here over to there, and they're arranged by spore print color. So we start with white spores, and that group includes lactarius, which I studied, and russula, which Tavis is studying. So tomorrow when we get more Russell names on these things, he can talk more about the Russell. But um, this is Lactarius torminosus. I don't see this every year. It's really pretty because it's pinkish color and it has a beard. So there's some Lactarius that have a bearded margin. There's some coarse hairs on the edge, kind of like what um, uh, Bro uh, Brooke looked like last year. <laughs> a nice beard. And this, um, most Lactarius are not really that great for edibility. The good one is Lactarius volimus. Uh, we have a few of those somewhere um, down here. And Brooke um, can talk about those in a second. The Torminosis is the pretty one that's with, um, it's mycorrhizal with furch. Um, other of these gilled mushrooms are a bunch of um, a bunch are mycorrhizal with trees. A bunch are soil sap robes or litter sap robes or uh, wood sap robes. We have a lot of things that decompose wood. Um, this is plums and custard, which is a favorite because of the red color with the yellow color. Trichomopsis rutilans. That's a pretty one. My conifers. Uh, we do have, um, the first ammonite that came in is Ammonita lavendula, which in the older books will be under Citrina. But Citrina is a, a European species, and our, um, Rod Tullis studied our um, Ammonita in America and found out that um, if the cold, weather is cold enough, this turns lavender. So there's a, Ammonita citrina variety lavendula, and because this is different than the European one, he elevated that to Ammonita lavendula. Because when it's cold, it'll have a lavender color to it. And because there isn't one that doesn't get a lavender color to it here, right? Citrina isn't here. 
The real citrine is not here. Yeah. yeah. So they all get that lavender. So a lot of them you don't see the you don't see the you don't see the uh, violet because it's not cold enough. But um, genetically they're the same. Um, I'm not going to tell you all of these white spore things. You can look at them here. There's another Lactarius. This is uh, one of my favorites. This is Lactarius thyenos. This is in the Deliciosus group with the orange latex. Um, and this one is different than some of the others. This does not stain green. It stays a nice orange. And this grows with balsam fir, sometimes um, in a wetland or at the edge of a wetland or up in the woods like today. And that's a really pretty. Um, and these are sort of tolerably edible, but the texture is not very good. Um, we have a Lactarius vietus, which is a, a hot tasting little gray Lactarius. Um, we have some different Lacaria. These have spiny spores under the microscope. Those are pretty cool. Longipes has a long stem in the bog. Longipes means long foot, and that's in sphagnum. Lacata, Lacaria lacata is the regular boring Lacaria. Um, and Lacaria bicolor is like a bigger Lacata, but it has, um, when it's fresh enough, it has purple on the bottom of the stem. Um, there's uh, some other species, uh, smaller species of these, and some other species of west. Um, Brooke can talk about Antiloma abortivum, and we have an armillary here. Okay. Have a, have a, oh. okay um, so, does everybody know what used to be called aborted Antiloma, and it's now abortive Antiloma? <laughs> it's uh, it's it changed its name because we figured out better how it actually works. So, this is actually a honey mushroom an armillaria uh, that has been parasitized or taken over by an entoloma that we don't have on the table, which is a little gray capped mushroom, but it invades this honey mushroom before it is able to become a honey mushroom and turns it into this weird, scary blob that uh, if you sort of look inside of it, it sort of looks like it's buggy, but it's not. That's the armillaria mushroom in there. Um, and this is one of my favorite, favorite... Oh, is this the antiloma? Yep. Well, this is an antiloma. Yeah, that's not the antiloma. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly not. But this mushroom took over... Shoot. <laughs> this mushroom. This mushroom took over this mushroom. The gray one took over the brown one and turned it into this weird white thing, which is still brown inside. I'll get it, I'll get it. Um, this, this... Uh, where did that come from? There. Okay. So, the honey mushroom is edible... It, after you start eating mushrooms, it sort of quickly becomes not your favorite, but it's still, it's an edible mushroom. Um, Armillaria, uh, uh, Malaya is usually eaten. This one is Gallica, which grows off the forest floor. Um, Malaya is usually yellow. But the aborted Antiloma, um, they call it shrimp of the woods. Uh, or lamb's ears. Uh, or, okay. Or hunter's heart. So, so I grab just, I grab this. This is the Antiloma abortivum that is parasitizing the armillaria and creating the shrimp of the woods or the armillaria buttons. Um, these these go uneaten by people who don't understand that number one you want to field dress them by cutting off the base which is filthy and then you want to take a moment you want to rinse them really well in cold water and you want to lay them out on a towel and dry them back to factory just the same consistency which is kind of heavy and meaty that they had in the woods and then slice them and brown them really, really well for a long time over medium high heat. And this is a delicious mushroom when it's browned well. Um, I tell people this and they get grossed out, but I grew up, my people were farm people and I used to eat calf's brains and squirrel brains. And this is a great substitute for that. It's very meaty, is the point. If you never ate brains, you'll just think... <laughs> if you never ate brains, you'll just think it's a delicious mushroom. And I want more people eating this. But brown what? Uh, should I do lacaria? But it's, this is actually a good mushroom. Lacaria lacata is an underrated edible. It's, you find it nearly every time you go in the woods. Learn to ID it. And then when you take your friends out and you don't find any of the mushrooms you were after, you can cook this mushroom and it's very good. Lacaria lacata. It's great in pasta. You know what common name for it? No. Black lac. 
The Deceiver. I did not know that. The Deceiver. Black Black. Black Black. Lucario Lakata. Black Black. Oh. That's all it is. Well, Amethyst is Caesar, but this is regular Caesar. You go ahead and go back here. Hips of Zygus. Zygus, sure. Yeah, we can do that. Careful. So we've got a few species of Hips of Zygus here. We've got Tessellatus, which this one is, and Almarius, the Almoster. We see those on box seller in the fall. This mushroom was looking for oxygen. So where it started to grow was underneath some bark, I'm assuming. Who found it? It was under bark. It was all the way like up into the tree. Sure, sure. So it just keeps reaching. They've grown other species uh, in long glass tubes of CO2, and they will grow indefinitely until they find oxygen, and then they level out so that their gills are even to the world uh, before they liberate their spores. So this one had quite a journey uh, before it, it found the atmosphere. And that way it knows that its spores are going into the breeze and not just dumping on themselves. Usually it comes out of knot holes. Not, not holes is where you typically see it. So you'll see Hypsozygous very typically with a 90 degree stem. This is Hypsozygous tessellatus. It has a tessellate cap or a water spotted cap you can see. And the property that causes it to level out like that is gravitropism. Gravi so it's... it's there are yeah, a lot this, of this is this is a trophy. Yeah. yeah you know, if, you, really if you knew a mushroom taxidermist, I would have. To <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do that. Sure. <laughs> Something I've been working. It's also it's a good edible. In case we didn't mention that, I quite like it. Yeah, they, yeah, they're good. Really? And and, uh, and widely cultivated. We got some different hygrosomies. We're going to work on these a bit more tomorrow and get some more names on those. There's like 20 species of those wax caps. We've got some Pluteus with this is pink spores that goes over on the other table. And Puma has pink spores. Um, this is the orange mock oyster. It's not, I don't think it's edible, is it? It's not edible. Um, it has a smell. Um, it's starting to get develop a nasty smell when it gets older like this. What's the name of it? Ninja Lands. It's orange on both sides. Uh, where's Brooke? Right here. Lactarius molinus? Oh. No. Certainly, I mean, it's certainly not. Oh no, it's not, not this sorry. one, but th but that is an edible. No, yeah, that's that's gonna be. Like, none of these are no. really. Oh, this one. Sorry, this is more in the camp for ice cream. None of these are. Camp for ice cream. Sorry. No, none of those are. Mm -hmm. You can ignore that for. Right okay. So this is the we've got over there. We've got a brown sport yep. foliota, and here we've got a white sport mushroom that looks like foliota. So it's called leucofoliota. Leuco refers to white. So it's an unrelated thing that has scales on the top like a foliota, but it's got white spores and white gills. It's quite handsome. We've got some Clitospes. Most of those are crap. And we've got one good one, the Tosby Nuda, which is uh, one of Brooke's favorites. Uh, this is a bluet. These are bluets, and everybody needs to know these. They're fruiting now. They grow in leaf litter, in needle litter. Um, Lapista Nuda, it used to be Clytosaby Nuda. I used back to Clytosaby. <laughs> okay, good, because then I can just erase whatever the heck Lapista means. Um, but this mushroom is really, really outstanding. Um, abundant usually when you find it. I think they're just starting now and it's great roasted like this stands up to like 350 uh, in, in the oven like cooked with potatoes or whatever. It's just a really rich delicious robust good mushroom It's also you know, it's not it up, Because it has white spores so until you learn to recognize it you want to do spore prints on this because there's there there's some there's kind of a brown shine on that but I know this will have white spores they're because off white. They're white to uh, very pale lavender or buff. They're Caucasian. When in doubt, 
when in doubt, do a score for it. It also has an inrolled margin, which and you can see usually on the younger specimens. It kind of curves on the too, though, right? Right, and the right. and the courtiers will have a veil and brown spores. This is also yeah. an exceedingly easy mushroom to grow. Don't, don't take substrates home with you if you've traveled from far away because that's just a recipe for disaster. But if you find these where you live and you take some of the leaf litter home with you and add it to your fall leaf litter, you can grow these super easily. The bluets? Yeah. And why you don't want to transmit a form of disease? Uh, no, yeah, like a foreign pasture disease is unlikely you would, but uh, no, we don't like to take things. Okay, you can buy this. Uh, um, now would you be cooked here? Oh, for sure. But I believe that with all mushrooms, with exceptions that don't even worth mentioning, like cook your mushrooms. Cook the water out of them. They're mostly water, so to get the best flavor, you got to cook them. Don't be shy about it. Roast that at three. So, this is a pink sport. We've got a few things here. Pluteus has pink spores and free gills, and most of those are on wood. The Entoloma family have pink spores, but the gills are attached, which means the stem, the gills come into the stem. And we've got the salmon um, Entoloma, which has a, a conical point, so that's called a unicorn Entoloma. We've got a Trichopilus, which is a rare type of Entoloma that's very scaly, hairy. Um, and there's several of these. Um, this one isn't very violet, so I don't know what name to put on this, but I'm going to save it. Um, Trichopilus means hairy cat. Um, this is the Entoloma aboard of them, the regular Entoloma that, is a, that attacks the honey cat. But the regular Entoloma is a mushroom, gray, kind of light gray, brown. And the gills are decurrent. They run down the stem. Most Entoloma, they don't. Um, and this is one of the bigger Entolomas. So you often find the Entoloma with the aborted forms. Um, the regular form is not as good as the aborted forms. I don't I know if anybody eats them. You can eat them, and uh, I think it's better. some people do. You like them better? Uh, yeah. Okay. Way better. Yeah. <laughs> but this is an advanced texture. mushroom. Exactly. It's an. That's the thing. It's that's an advanced mushroom. Whereas the the abortive and the abortive forms are uh, easy to identify for almost anyone here, so I always just recommend that people stick with those. Um, you, while they do grow right next to each other, you could happen upon a lookalike that is, and then people will think, oh, it's growing right next to it. If you know they don't really pay as close of attention, and so they just throw it in their basket. So. I suggest sticking with the aborted form. Here's those uh, foliotas that have the scaly caps on wood with brown spores. And we've got two types so far. Sclerosa has um, big brown scales and the cap is dry. Sclerosoides looks similar, but if you feel the cap, it's sticky. So it's viscid when it's fresh um, with dry scales on the top. Um, and there's some other foliotas, but this is sclerosa and sclerosoides, which look similar. And I don't know if anybody eats foliota. Well, you can eat foliota Nemeco. It's a cultivated one. It's quite good. A little bit slimy. The texture's terrible on both of those. Yeah. Just, chewing kind of like woody, saw, sawdusty snack It's almost so like now, it grew out of wood. Um, now we've got some rusty brown things, rusty brown spores. And a lot of these are Cortinarius, which is a very large, difficult group. There's maybe five or six hundred species in North America. So most of these you'll see don't have species names because um, I don't pull names out of the hat anymore. Uh, but the best one used to be Rosites because it has a ring, but um, DNA sequencing showed that it's actually a Cortinarius. And Brooke can tell you about this one. This is one of the um, uh, best eating mushrooms in the North Woods here. And the the name for this mushroom has been gypsy mushroom for many years. Um, I don't actually know why that is. Origin unknown. Okay, cool. Maybe it's just because everybody likes it. Um, the diagnostic for this mushroom, when you're looking for it in the woods, this one has been rained on or rubbed on, I'm not sure, but this specimen has what we call the bloom, which is this iridescent, whitish, lavender kind of blush to the cap on the tan cap. It looks like someone kind of took some powdered sugar and yeah. popped it on the top. Or like pixie dust. <laughs> and uh, when, when you, so if you learn that, you can't really make a mistake on this mushroom. That plus the ring. It will 
not necessarily wash off, but if it fades a lot with water. So yeah. if it's rained recently, that's it's gonna. If it hasn't rained recently, it's only gonna be on almost every one of them. But, Go ahead. But I would, again, that's another uh, one of the more advanced edibles. I would recommend learning those, uh, the ring and the bloom, and really looking for those when you're, if you're going to pick them to eat them. If you don't see the bloom or you don't see the ring, don't assume that it is. If you use mushrooms for dyeing fabric or yarn, Cortinary Semisanguinius here with the red gills is one of the dye fungi that is popular. And that's really pretty with the orange cap, orange brown cap with the red, bright red gills. I think that makes a pink dye. Not sure. Makes pink and red depending on the uh, the mordant you okay. use. You get a deep red from it. Um, what kind of iron, right? And what kind of metal? Is that the mordant? Mordant would be that. You could do like ferrous sulfate, which would be iron. You could do alum. Alum would brighten it, and an iron would sadden it or darken it. Um, we've got some. Um, inky cat mushrooms. We've got a Paxillus. This is poisonous. Can you say anything about that? Just, can you scrape the gills off of it? Or uh, is it one of those? I don't know. I don't actually ever see this. But that's brown sport and poisonous, so learn that one. We've got a couple of Garicus. This is a big Agaricus with a veil. And um, Agaricus have veils and they have dark chocolate brown spores. Um, so this is young and still opening up. So this is Agaricus arvensis. This gets pretty big. And was this found in a lawn? Um, it was right off of a parking lot, actually. <laughs> and it's our it's arvensis because we know that because of its size. Generally, the other ones. How well, close is that to the uh, the ones you buy at the grocery store? They're in the same store. genus. Yeah, it's, it's a genus. It's different species. No, okay. yeah, of course. So, yeah. I cannot stand store-bought agaricus. I, I, my stomach turns to think about them. I'm sorry, but any of the wild agaricus that are edible are, are just a revelation. If you like if or think you like cream of mushroom soup from Campbell's or any of those store-bought mushrooms, the stuffed mushrooms, eat, learn agaricus, the wild ones, and learn to eat the right ones, and your, your mind will be blown. The flavor, the texture, the, the complexity, I... I understand what the store-bought mushrooms are going for, but if I never put one of those in my mouth again, it'll be too soon. This is a great, this is good. And I do not identify the bullies up here because there's already four people that argue about them. Uh, Tavis, Brooke, Brad, and... Jeremy. Jeremy, and sometimes Arnie. Uh, so um, Tavis and Brooke are going to tag team on the Oli. These are mushrooms that have pores. Most of them have kind of a yellow brown spore print. Um, Tilopolis has pinky spores. I'm just going to do the edibility parts. Oh, okay. Uh, Bolit is not really a, a name for a family. It's more of a name for a shape. Uh, the mm -hmm. lineage changes a lot. So some of them are actually related to Paxillus. Some are related to the, the Belize proper. So we've got we've got quite a variety here. In the Northwoods, you're going to see a lot of Lexinum. We have, I think, seven species of Lexinum here. All are edible, easily identified. If you look up close, they've got scabers on the stem that you can feel. I've, I've drank dirt before, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, all of them are edible. Yeah, and you can you can see the scabers on there. Uh, the name scaber makes them sound like they're going to be spiky. They're not. They're actually more like a piece of felt. So we've got Holopus, Versapelli, Snellii, and Scabrum that I've seen for sure. I'm sorry, did you say all of the venom are edible? All of them. Beliefs in Wisconsin are extremely safe. There's a couple I would avoid, uh, but for the most part, Beliefs here are very safe. They're not always great. You know, we've got uh, you Sweetless Americanus them, here. Yeah, there's nothing that's dangerously poisonous. What you uh, said is the Lexinum. All, Lexinum. All, Lexinum. All, Lexinum. all of our species of Lexinum are Yeah, those are all edible for they sure. They have a high reaction This is, a, this is rate. our most common one here. This is Lexinum versapelli. Yeah, this grows with hardwoods here. And you can see the scabers on the stem very yeah. clearly on this one. And you can feel them. They're not scabery. These, yeah. these are soft. a mushroom like uh, Chicken of the Woods that has a high reactivity rate. So reactive 
reaction rate with people who eat it. So if you do especially eat these, raw, raw, you're gonna have yeah, problems. Uh, drying them helps, um, but yeah, if you. What are they like cooked up? Uh, well, texturally, the Lexanum are mar marshmallowy. They're kind of squishy, so typically people would dry them before they use them. But the flavor is fantastic. Some of them are very good. Uh, Sweetless Weavery, I saw it somewhere here today. Maybe it's not plated yet. Yeah, I don't think it's plated yet. Is is excellent. Is there still a problem? Uh, on the, there's some that are more reddish colored, uh, Lexanum, I think, that... Two years ago, we weren't supposed to eat this stuff. Well, so with the stems, yeah. sure. And, and we've also heard the thing where the ones that have the sterile flaps are on the edge. So that'd be Vulpinum versus Versapelli. Uh, one was poison. I, no. It's what it ended up happening is people were undercooking them or they were overindulging in them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Most typically. Yeah. yeah well, is it a poisonous mushroom? Certainly not. Okay, so we no, could dry the mushroom. stocks, but the stocks aren't quite as good as the cap anyway, right? Well, I've had I had them prepared last year by somebody knows what they're doing. They were very good, all parts. Okay. And, all yeah. Parts. So in, when I say it has a high reaction rate, that c there isn't there isn't a lot of uh, research with some of these mushrooms as to whether it's always uh, in the environment. I told you whether it's always in the environment. <laughs> Or whether it's from the from specific mushroom to mushroom, even when they're growing right next to each other, the different levels of certain chemicals, you know, that there are different reasons for some of these mushrooms to have different reactive rates. Uh, cook them right and, uh, and prepare them well would be the first step into making sure that you don't have... This is Brooke's favorite edible bullet. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, this I one literally is. just said, don't. No. <laughs> so, so this is Bolitinellus merileoides. This is an ash tree bullet. It's not in association with the ash tree. It's in association with an aphid that eats the roots of an ash tree. So, like I say, it, it grows on aphid sweat, and it tastes very similar. <laughs> uh, I, I describe it as tasting like basement floor. Michael Quo said, "Dirty metal." This one, it has that odor. It's not. It's not great. But with bugs in it, like dirty metal with bugs in it. Like, don't eat that. So this one is genetically not related at all to the rest of the bolites. But it has a pore layer that's inseparable, which is different than most of these. Most of these, this pore layer separates as a layer from the, the rest of the flesh. This one does not. But it's still a bolete because it has a central stem and it has a, a, a layer of pores. It looks like a polypore, looks like a bolete. But it's not boletus proper. Uh, we've got some of the prettier ones here, genus Swillus. Oh, this is Swillus pictus, our painted bolete. Spraggy, I know. Spraggy, yeah. Spraggy, yeah, of course. Yeah, we all do yeah, that name changed a few years ago. Whatever. We can still call pictus, pictus if we want to. Uh, a tamarack associate, a pine associate. I found it with white pine. Came out of the bog. This And you find them in bogs sometimes by the hundreds. Uh, delicious, but look at that texture. It's Gross. So, so but wait, I want to say, I thought this mushroom was bad. They're, they're great. Until I started drying it. And then using it, that mushroom improves a thousand percent when you dry it and then reuse it, reconstitute it. What about this guy? Um, edible. <laughs> <laughs> what, do, what do you do about the slime on top? It cooks People away. Peel them. It's okay. peeling it is a waste of your energy and okay. time. Yeah, it truly is. So, like, like sweetest, sweetest luteus is what we would call the slippery jack. This is our version here. This is sweetest grevellei. Uh, if you want to sit and peel that whole thing, be my guest. I tried. Yeah, cook it. It's fine. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. they used to say to peel flabby line of velutopies, the little tiny velvet foot mushroom. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you, you'll die of starvation. <laughs> One of my favorite mushroom jokes is a, is a Brit Bunyard joke, and it's, if someone asks you if, if coral mushrooms are edible, you say, yeah, but you just peel the tips. Right. <laughs> uh, we've got several mushrooms that contain variegatic acid, another acid I can't recall off the top of my head. Uh, that oxidize to different colors when exposed. Uh, so this is uh, Gyropora cyanescens. Everybody needs to see yeah, this. Yeah, anybody that yeah. hasn't yeah. seen this before, come on in. Cool. I'll do it over here. Too. And, and, and I'm hoping for a good reaction here. Sometimes this is very fast. But this is Gyropora cyanescens. This is a great edible mushroom. And it's barely turning. Oh, there it goes. There you go. Is that the one when the where the root turns purple? It's, it's oxidizing. Uh, this all parts stain blue. This okay. one's very sensitive. Handling it has turned most of it blue. Yeah, here's and a better one. There, there, yeah, that one. That one will go faster. So that's how you confirm it. That's one of the ways. But there's several species that do this. 
in, in, in several genera. Bayrangia does it. Gyroporus. Uh, Landmoa does it. Okay, well, Gyroporus, oh some gosh, species do it. Gyroporus cyanescens is a really easy mushroom to identify because of uh, not just the bluing and the, the yellow color to it, but it has a stem, a stipe, that when you cut it open, oh. this isn't a great example, but as it ages, it's going to get two to three hollow chambers inside the stipe, and they're separated by like a cottony material, which is, if you look at the younger one, it's gonna be, the whole thing is gonna be full of it, but as it ages, it opens up a little bit. You can see another, another hole down in the bottom here, and then another, basically a cotton ball wedged up in there. And so I love to show these to people because they're a delicious edible, they're a really tasty bully, and they're super easy to identify. They're really cool because you can show them off to everyone in the woods. And they're edible. They're a really good edible. And they look cool in the pan when you're cooking them. Gosh, they do. Uh, this is one of the Porcini clade or the Boletus edulis clade. It's got the tag on it, Boletus chippoensis. I don't think that's right. I don't think so either. Whatever. I found, uh, well, this is I found a monster. It. I found uh, it typically, spruce. we don't see them this large. I think I found it under spruce. It, uh, it, it, it could be, it, it's hard to say at this age. It's definitely edulous clade, but it could be, it could be pseudopinophilus. It, it could be a couple of. Is the other reddening clade. at the top of the articulation anything? It could be subsary lessons. It's just uh, faded out too. There, it, it's one of the kings. It's definitely edible and wonderful if it wasn't gross like that. So how we? How if we, you found that ten days ago, it would have been fantastic. How we tell our kings? There's again a quick checklist. It has a uh, generally a yellow, orange, brown, reddish top. Uh, depending on the species, and then it's got, the pores are going to start white or really light colored yellow and turn yellow to, they'll have black nasty staining on them. This one's really gross because it's older. So you're looking for those pores, but they don't, it's not going to stain like a bluing bolete. It's not going to stain or turn blue at all. And then the main thing is on the stipe, if you look closely, it has this netted reticulation. So it looks almost like a fishing net along the stipe. And there's uh, another genus that we have uh, called Tylopolis that has that netted reticulation, but it's but it's darker reticulation, and then it it's also, darker than its background. It's darker this than, one looks like that because it's been handled exactly, so it's dirty. And but uh, the main way that you tell the difference between so if you've got your your uh, not it's not staining, it has the right color top, it has the right color pore surface, and it has the netted reticulation, and then you taste it. For the raw flesh, taste it. If it's Tylopolis, the look-alike, it'll be horribly bitter. And so you'll know right then. Uh, going out in the woods in northern Wisconsin, especially this far north after the forest collision happens, we run into Hemilexinum subglabropes. This is the most common bolete that we have here. Yellow stem, bright yellow pores, edible and very, very good. As common as it is, though, there is no common name for it. So you have to say Hemilexanum subglabropes every time you find it. <laughs> it's called the common bully. Common bully is fine with me. Here. But if you drive two hours south, it's absent. When you're eating bully, do you eat the, the, the spore? If you look at it, too? if you look at it from the side, so we'll cut we'll cut this sweetless here. If we looked at it from the side, and this line here goes upwards, I would leave it in place. If it is flat or goes downward, then I would peel it off. And it does peel off pretty easy on most sweetness are a little tougher with the porcini there, there you go see how it comes off there right to the yellow so we would we would take that layer off and just discard it it's tasty but it's mushy and it often has a lot of bugs in it with the porcini when they're younger if they're still white to turning yellow you, can, fine. you can totally keep that pore surface and this here is Mm -hmm. I wouldn't eat any of this mushroom anyway, but if you found one that was still good with a layer that thick, I would definitely peel that off. Exactly. And it, and it does come off if as this, a layer. If this wasn't buggy, this flesh would still be fine inside. Yeah. I mean, it's still it's white. Actually, it's and, not that bad. No, it's not. I would eat, <laughs> if I had to, I would eat this. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you can just pull this. This whole, it, I've gotten them so you can get the whole edge and pull it off in one piece, and you have a ring of sponge. This is, cool. this is mildly blue staining, isn't it? I'm not sure. It gets darker. Hemilexinum? Yeah. Mild blue staining. Here's another one of our blue staining bullies that we would have just called Boletus bicolor. Uh, no, it's... Uh, or so not, we yeah, have no, called it that. We, we have called it in the past. But, yes. Yeah. 
but um, it's been split up a, a bunch. We have several of these uh, yellow, reddish top, blue staining bolites. This one is Bolita pseudosensibilis. So what's the standard message on the blue staining? It used there to, isn't one. There isn't one. There is, one. There is no. One. There's no standard no. message on almost. There are a few, few golden rules with mushrooms, but like the English language, there's almost always an exception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If there's if it's purple spore gild and stains blue, that's something else. <laughs> 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 we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll leave that joke for the professionals. Uh, I got it. Uh, polypores, Patrick, you want to do polypores? Uh, water with them, and if it turned black, then we, they, we would, you know, it's like, no. But that kind of goes to show you how few mushrooms are actually toxic out in these woods. I mean, you should know them, you should be very aware of them. But the, the idea that mushrooms are generally poisonous with the exception of a few edibles is not the case at all. It's mostly that they're either not tasty, uh, the texture is wrong, so the vast majority of mushrooms here are neither poisonous or edible. They're somewhere in between, like grass, you know. Are there uh, common blue staining bolete family mushrooms around here that are somewhat toxic? Um, no. There aren't? No. Um, that's a total life's tale. Yeah, so, our, well, okay, yeah, so that used to be one of the rules. The south, there are some. There are some in the north. United States. Okay, um, but, but not here. But like Tavis was saying, generally the bolete's here, if it's if it's a bolete, it's not going to cause you serious poisoning. Um, it's actually kind of a rule with that there's like cyanums that look, they look kind of like this, but they're bigger, and they um, they grow at the same time as the boletus ruberceps, and they have a squat, fat stipe like this, and people accidentally will mix one of those into a big collection of the big king boletes in Colorado. And if you see blue staining in there, that is a bad sign. You need to find the lexinum in there because that one can make people ill. Okay. It's not going to kill them, but it can make you pretty sick. And then people say, I hate boletus ruberceps. No, you ate some of that lexinum that's whatever it is out there, orantia or whatever it is. But yeah, that one blewing out there. With the amount of porcini I picked this summer, I'm... Kind of, I've got this trash bag full of dried porcini, and I'm kind of like, man, I really hope there's not one of those. <laughs> You'll find out. <laughs> Someone will. I've been giving a lot of them away. <laughs> so we've got some different polypores. Most polypores are tough or woody, and you don't eat them um, because most people don't eat bark and wood. Um, like what I was saying. Yeah. So the texture is not so good. These but. are considered uh, medicinal for, to the homeopathic community. This is one of the mushrooms, I believe, that was found with a Garricon man, or Otzi, one of the, the prehistoric guy people. In the Alps. Is yeah. that the tinder fungus then? Uh, that, that's not the tinder one. conch. Um, the tinder conch yeah. is somewhere over here. We'll probably get to, to call it that. To it. There's another one. There, yeah, the tinder conch is also was also on him, and it's also a birch polypore. So this is Formiotopsis. Is, is that the horse hoof one or yep. whatever? Yep. That's the tinder conch. It's horse hoof okay. bracket. Yep. And so this this like I was saying is considered an antiviral. That's what people believe it's active in, and it's you make a tea with it, and it's one of the most bitter things you'll ever experience in your life. If, if you dry it and pull, there's kind of a fuzzy material inside. It's a styptic to stop bleeding. Um, yep, it was yep. commercially produced for a while. That's polypore, you said. Yeah. Can I break it? Yeah. Find them out there. Yeah. Good luck. It's pretty tough. Oh, it is really tough. Um, we've got Ischnoderma rosinosum, which is tolerably edible. Some people like it um, when it's young. Um, you can trim the edge the edge off when it's got a white growing edge. These are too old, I think, and too tough. There's a young it's a, one over here. Yeah, so it's got a. Um, this is a younger one. Um, it's brown, velvety on top, and white, pale pores that stain brown. The whole thing stains brown. And Brooks. Um, so this this is a mushroom that I I've eaten it and I've eaten other people who prepared it well. If you get it young when it's very very rubbery, this is too old. It should have kind of a whitish edge. And the best way to eat this is just to trim off that very soft white edge wherever your knife will slip through very easily, and take that home and cook it. And it's really it's got a beef flavor. It's like beef um, beef bourguignon. Kind of. You know, it's a wine beef flavor, and you can cook it like that. It stands up to a lot of cooking. 
like most mushrooms, um, and like, as far as I know, all the polypores, except maybe Heresio. But um, yeah, uh, Melissa is calling this Salisbury Steak of the Woods. There she is. <laughs> and she's the person to talk to about eating this. I, I like it when she cooks it. Rose has a different name for it. The Delicious Slug of the Woods. There's a story behind that. <laughs> Um, we've got this Grafola thing. Some people eat that. Oh! <laughs> and that's so excited. She found, I mean, this is the only one. They're not that common up here. Like, they, this is a really I, nice one. They're mushroom. actually quite common about three or four weeks after you guys leave. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fall. Fall power. Yep. Yeah, I find them right before the snow falls up in Bayfield. And I'm sure really? it's... Yeah. It's, it's a great, it's one of the greatest edibles there is. Um, the comments that I have to make on it are, I actually like to field dress mine first by taking off whatever I'm, I know I'm not going to eat, you know what I mean? So I take home a lot less, it makes it easier to carry. And I learned a terrible lesson in New Jersey when I was living in New York. I picked several about like this nice specimen here. Brought them home, I was slicing into it, and I saw this slimy tail heading uh, down. Yeah. So I stopped with the knife, and I pulled it apart, and there were two salamanders in there. Aww. One of which turned out to be, long story short, a federally endangered ambistoma Aww. that I had crossed state lines with. Aww. And there was, the, Long story short, I managed to get back five weeks later to the exact tree and the exact hens fruiting again in New Jersey, and I stuck those things back in there, and I never pulled a whole hen out again. Nothing wrong with it, but just, you know, a cautionary tale. <laughs> my, makes good pickles. <laughs> my, my taki, yeah, great. it's great for pickling. It has a, it has a good texture. It's good for jerky, uh, mushroom jerky. Um, it is considered a medicinal in Japanese culture, too. Um, it's, it's immune enhancing. Um, I, I make tea with that and reishi, and... My uh, experience has been over, overwhelmingly positive. So. You but don't it's pour also boil it, do you? No, uh, no you dry it and just make a tea with it. No, I'm talking about when you cook it, you don't need to pour boil it. Oh no, when you cook it, uh, no, it's just it's a delicious uh, edible. If you're gonna if you're gonna preserve it, like just you want it the way it is, the best thing that I do with those is freeze them fresh. So you take the fronds, you separate it all out, you like you're about to throw it in the pan. And you put it on a cookie sheet and put it in the put them all separated on a cookie sheet. Let them freeze, and then you can take them all and put them in a bag, and they're not frozen together. And then you take them from there and put them right in a pan. You don't let them thaw or anything afterwards. So you just go right from there to a hot pan. And there's a few. There's a lot of mushrooms that works well with, um, but most almost every mushroom has the has a best way to preserve it, in my opinion. Um, like chanterelles, my favorite way is a neutral oil. Cook them and freeze them. You can pull them out and do that. But these, my favorite way is fresh frozen. Really? There's yeah. not that many that you can do that. With. Not, not that I've experienced. No, uh, maybe more than, maybe more than I than I know of. And the only reason that I know that that one is good is because it's the only way I've been able to really preserve it that well. You know. You don't do any salt rinse before doing that. You just no, I, I never up rinse with salt. Uh, okay. I like worms. They're tasty. Okay. <laughs> well, they're cooked. They don't hurt you. Protein. No, I'm just kidding, but I. I Generally, actually, I don't pick a lot of wormy mushrooms because it's kind of yeah. We've got some other polypores here you could look at when you have time, including the turkey tail, which is a um, medis popular medicinal um, uh, little bracket. We don't have some good examples of that. Maybe tomorrow we'll get some better ones. Um, this is one of the coolest things up here, especially the first time we found it. Um, this, this was Hymenokiti. Cabocina, because it's a tooth tooth crust, on, um, and this species is mostly on alder, but now it's uh, in hydnoporia, which means tooth pores. And this one, um, I have a web page I built uh, about a year ago on this genus hydnoporia, and these are the glue crusts. And we went to Ernholt and looked in the looked in the. Um, Alder swamp, and I found the first one, and then Brooke found um, some he just better one. Space. He Brooke like was that. sad, but then he went it's off trail and found a bunch more, so we're both happy. But the, the cool thing is, this will grow on live or dead alder stems, and then when another alder stem comes over and touches the first one, the fungus mycelium glues the two stems together, 
So you can see there's this black, black material. That's the mycelium gluing these two branches together. And then down here, this brown stuff is where it's making spores. So Hidnoporia tabacina, tabacina refers to the tobacco brown pore layer or a, a spore producing layer on the branch. So we've got both the glue yeah. part and the reproductive part on here. And um, the first one I found had um, this little branch glued on here. And then it had this bigger branch um, that was attached um, it was attached somewhere up here. So it had two different branches on here that were glued. These are, these are all alder. Alder glue is alder the common glue. name. Um, but there's some other... <laughs> that um, was a 12-foot branch that we yeah, had to this figure was, out how to bring home. Yeah. So. Yeah, and someone big. miraculously had a hedge trimmer on yeah. them yes. in the woods. <laughs> That's an interesting mission to have in life. But you can see the black, together. the black part is the glue part of the fungus that glues the branches together. And then if you find if you can find the brown, um, the toothy brown part, that's where it's making spores down here. So look at that one. There's a, there's a few other um, there's a few other glue crusts. There's one that's common down Chicago area and other places in the Midwest that's on oak branches and some other branches. Um, it's in this genus, but um, you very rarely find it as a glue crust and. On my website, I took a photo that Gary Linkoff had of one they found in New York. And that's a also a kind of a rusty brown toothy um, pore layer. Um, and it turns out that these things um, were going under a European name until somebody sorted them out, uh, a group of people sorted them out in America. And we, it turns out we have three hidden aporias in North America, maybe four. Um, and there's, there's differences in how the, the color of the glue part and the color of the spore producing part. And that's on my website, uh, michaelguide.com. Um, look for Hidnoporia. Um, there's not very many websites for Hidnoporia yet. But um, the one that we have in Chicago area is Hidnoporia olivacea. It's sort of an olive brown, and I haven't seen it with the glue crust yet, so we've got to look for that one. Uh, in the Midwest. But if you go in an alder swamp and you look, you can find this thing where the, the branches get glued together. We worked pretty hard for these specimens today. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm still wet for a oh, no. But it was worth it. I mean, for alder glue. I'll do anything for alder glue. <laughs> um, Brooke can talk about these teeth fungi. Okay. Um, some of these, um, well, I guess all four of these are edible. Yeah. And then after that, you can look at the coral fungi we've got. And some jelly fungi that we got, and the puffballs down here. So we'll probably have more examples of these different groups tomorrow. It's funny that you left these as teeth fungi because there there's no relationship. But I guess that's just structural. So, yeah. So if you were gonna organize these by families, the hidden them would go over there with chanterelles. They're basically chanterelles with teeth instead of ridges. And if you organize this one, this goes over with Russell lactarius and some other weird. Um, things like this clavulina. So there's different um, morphologies of these fungi, and they're not always related um, together. Um, so these are the hiddenums, or the hedgehog, or sweet tooth mushroom. They're related to chanterelles, but instead of the ridges that chanterelles have running down the stipe, these have teeth. And this, is, this has got to be two different species. They're still working out the names. I would call this umbilicatum. Probably because it's little and looks a little bit like a belly button in the middle. And then Tavis might be able to tell you a name on this one. It's either Repandum, which is the European name we always had, or there's a great big one here called Albo Magnus, which, I mean, I've seen them this big and all delicious and edible. This is one of the best edibles in the Northwoods. That's Repandum, the other one's Albo Magnum. Albo Magnum? Yeah. Okay. As in but, white bag. But this, I'm calling this umbilicatus. Because it is. Okay. Umbilicatum. <laughs> okay. It's an L. Um, it's okay. An L. All right. It is. Uh, I believe him. Can you tell him how to tow a car with this one? No, we didn't get there. We didn't get to that. You should tell him how to tow a car with that one. <laughs> Come on, Davis, show us your strength. Grab hold. <laughs> Come on, we got it.
Oh, wow. But but it didn't actually break. It just oh, tore a little bit. They are, they are stronger than we are. It's uh, <laughs> Polypris Badius. Place of bees and all. Okay. Just when it was which is, which is a, it's not a really a good name because originally the epithet was Pisopes, so if it reverted, it would be Pisopes, Pisopes, which is a violation of the taxonomic code. That smells amazing. Oh, they smell good. Wow. I didn't ever, I don't think I ever thought to smell that before. When it was on the tree, it was full of You would water. never be able to chew like that thing. <laughs> oh, this is one we skipped. This is one of my favorite little mushrooms. Linnea Gilman taught me this in Telluride. It's super widespread. This is the... Uh, the cat's tongue jelly yeah. fungus. Yeah, right, right. Isn't it awesome? It's a forest tree. Yeah. It's, and usually, like you can see, it's actually growing out of wood here. I don't know. There's wood on the back. But it's just these. We actually have some bigger ones someplace. I don't see them. But it's a translucent jelly. But if you look on the back there, there's little tiny, like, uh, uh, like a cat's tongue, you know? And this is actually an edible mushroom. And somebody was talking today about how you just put syrup on it until it tastes like the syrup, and then it gets makes like your own uh, uh, jelly. Yeah, gummy bears. So yeah, pseudohydnellum gelatinosum. So you can kind of remember that, right? It's too many syllables, but it's descriptive of the mushroom. And then another of the best edibles in the North Woods, Heresium coralloides, the bear's head tooth. Don't ask me why it's called that, but um, this is one of the uh, heresiums, like lion's mane, and it has the same flavor. Cooked up, this has the flavor and texture of really, really sweet crab. It's a really great edible mushroom, and usually abundant and in huge fruitings uh, on wood up here. So they also have the heresium arenaceus, the lion, the regular lion's mane, and either abietus or americanum, the long-toothed uh, puff lion's mane. But this is the typical one we see, and it's outstanding and. You should smell this and learn this. It's great. It takes some cleaning, but really good mushroom. Um, I actually just like to saute it. Like saute it for a reasonable amount of time till I get a little browning on it till the water's cooked out. And uh, then after that, I'll often add it to a pasta because I like it as like a kind of a fish meat, crab meat pasta dish. I couldn't afford enough crab to put in there, but I can usually find enough Arecio. So, so that's all of yeah. these are, are the same. Huh? Are all hedgehogs, are all these with teeth hedgehogs and are they all edible? Any time you find something with teeth? No, not every time you find something with teeth. There's a, there's a, um, hawk's wing is sarcodon, which is here, which is, there's a species that's good out west, but not here. Just don't eat that. It'd be too bitter to eat. This is called sweet tooth because it's a sweet flavored mushroom. It's like a chanterelle flavor. This is just yeah. indescribably good edible. Oh, crap. Okay. That's only sitting there for a second, and I'm going to go get a picture, and then it's going to its corner. Okay, so um, this is a bowl leaf that we missed, but it's another gyroporus, just like the bluing bowl leaf, the gyroporus cyanescens, the turning blue bowl leaf. This is, has been for a long time going by gyroporus castanius, the chestnut bowl leaf, but uh, this one does not look like the ones that we have at home, and I've heard that the northern one is called gyroporus borealis. So this is a good mushroom to know. It's an excellent edible. You pretty much just want the caps on it. Um, and I never find enough of them at once to do much with. But if every time I go out, I find one or two, and I dry those, and I save a jar, in a year or so, I've got the best mushroom soup of all time. The best. This is the best soup mushroom. I love it. Yeah, very good mushroom. That one's, and they don't get that yeah, big. They, that's, that's unusually large. That's about twice the size you'll find them at least. Yeah. Uh, we're going to test it just for sport. Oh, it's... Um, uh, Rhodocalibia? No. no. Oh, wait. This isn't that Osacalus, is it? Nope. Uh, it has no centrally located stem. Is it an oyster? Nope. No. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, See, I don't feel so bad the, now. I'll give you the same hint that I gave at least to gentlemen. It was, if it was brown spore, it would be crepidotus. But it's white spore. That doesn't, it's not going to help. It, it, yeah, it, it, it's it, not. It didn't help me either. I don't, it's... It's ho... ho, 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 ho. Oh, ho and Gosh... <laughs> Dang it, I never I see this. <laughs> well, that's pretty cool. So that's one of the false oysters, but I wouldn't eat it. Dang it. I've been had! <laughs> no, I mean, I wasn't going to get that. I took that one off. Can't them all. Are we, are we about through? This is one of the false morels, but you usually find it in late summer or fall. That belongs on the ASCO table. Yeah, I don't know why it's here. Uh, don't... People eat gyromitris, never eat a gyromitra on wood. 
You probably shouldn't eat them anyway. I'm supposed to tell people that, but they taste like bacon. Don't eat this one. Do not eat Jeremiah on wood. Don't just tell them it tastes good. Hold on. There's a reason also not to eat it. I like bacon. No, 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 no. no. So, do the hard part. I did the fun part. Right. <laughs> the, they have a historical uh, uh, use in a lot of native cultures around here. I know a lot of people that eat them. Um, there are uh, studies on the different species, and it's looking like there's one or two species that actually have the chemicals that are causing sickness and even death in some people. Um, but how, what often happens is people will eat them for years and years and years, and then one day they eat the wrong one, or they eat too many, and there's an issue. So I know people who are like, they're just so good, I have to do it once a year. And I'm like, you know, there's a lot of tasty things. Eat some bacon. Yep. <laughs> but do, you do what you will. Uh, they, are, they are historically a, an edible mushroom. Um, but they do take a lot of the, the, the native peoples here boil them twice and discard the water so whether that's an actual thing you should be doing or probably is based on their long history of use but uh, the, the other thing with gyromycha, gyro, gyro, some gyromytra species too is that even when you're boiling them and discarding the water as you're cooking them it's off gassing a lot of the toxic and harmful alkaloids and chemicals that are within the mushroom itself. Yep. So even if you're doing that or taking it to the point where you're doing that twice, you want to do it in a well-ventilated area. Uh -huh. And for something like Gyromitra esculenta, it's just for me not worth the hassle when there's plenty of other edibles to be had if I'm looking for food. What for some people here, this is like obvious. Mm -hmm. And then for some reason, there's a lot of people who are like, but I really want to eat it. <laughs> what are the name toxic chemicals? Is this, is, I don't know what it's called, but it's the same thing that's found in rocket yeah. fuel. It's the same thing that's found in rocket, rocket fuel. fuel. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is a compound in it, yeah. That's, that's I don't know if that's the active well, toxic, toxic chemical that they are. It, it is one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Which are you talking about? Which one? In, the, in a false morale. Uh, we are Wisconsin Mycological Society. Check out our website and social media. We're an affiliate of the North American Mycological Association.